So today coincides with the day that we often celebrate uh, mothers and everything that they do. Uh, so first off, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers uh, here now and uh, mothers to be. As a child um, and a son, I, I am, I'm eternally grateful for all the things that my mother did for me. Uh, as a biologist, I'm actually a little bit envious and wonderstruck about what a mother's body can do. Um, with a really tiny, tiny sperm cell size contribution from dad, um, moms are the miraculous providers of life. Uh, this shuffling of uh, genetic material tends to even things out between mom and dad's contribution. But uh, mom once again does most of the heavy lifting as the embryo has to implant into the uterus. In fact, mom combines her tissues uh, with the baby's tissues in order to create an entirely new uh, organ called the placenta, absolutely essential for the survival of a baby through time. A mother not only uh, creates a new tissue, she also shares her own organs. And so in order to, to provide the nutrients that a baby needs for a pregnancy, and also to clear the waste that, that it accumulates in the amniotic sac, a mom needs to be able to, to use her organs for that purpose. So this, uh, this magical uh, trick, this superpower, when I was a, a much younger scientist, I used to think it was something that was limited to mothers. But it turns out there's many more people out there, 10,000 in the United States and about 750 uh, in Canada that also have this, this superpower. Uh, they share their organs, not with just one person, and sometimes, in some cases, eight individuals in order to save their lives. And they provide tissues that actually enhance the, the life of others, countless others. Um, those individuals are not uh, the infamous optimum. Uh, those individuals are organ donors. And their story often comes with a, a, a tinge of sadness as well, because oftentimes those donors are deceased, and recently deceased. Uh, 3,000 uh, individuals in Canada benefit from an organ donation notice to, to, to save their lives, but the sad reality is that there's almost twice that number of individuals who are waiting for an organ right now. So what that means is that in Canada, every 30 hours, someone dies waiting for an organ. In the United States, it's a much higher number. It's 20 every day. So what if we could figure out a way to wipe that deficit out? Um, to create enough organs for everyone to be able to live a healthy, long life. Um, some of that answer might come from uh, improving donor recruitment and harvesting tissues in a much better way. But what if we could take the need for donors out of the equation, literally, or, or, or increasing the disease? What if we can combine our knowledge of medicine, biology, and engineering and create machines that could help us generate tissues in addition? And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, we made this promise about 25 years ago, a quarter century ago, that we'd be able to use tissue engineering, a combination of taking biological matter, cells and the matrices that, and biomaterials that surround them, and be able to recreate structures that would be placed back into uh, individuals to, to help them live longer, healthy lives. And we've made some massive gains in, in the last 25 years in terms of how we grow cells and how we can synthesize materials to keep those cells happy. Um, even just last week, we had a huge advance in how we can engineer tissues by being able to recreate blood vessels as organs that are grown and dish expand so we can support the nourishment of those tissues. But the reality is that after 25 years, we really haven't fulfilled the promise yet of being able to deliver those tissues as things that we can transplant into to, to humans. I think we're at the stage, and what I'd like to, to talk to you about today is how we're getting really close to now developing new techniques and new technologies and leveraging advances in these areas uh, to be able to manufacture these organs in a way that will make them a lot more reliable for transplantation to patients. And part of that solution comes from something called bioprinting which essentially is creating a machine that can combine biological materials and cells in a way that can recreate some of the three-dimensional architecture that we see in our body. Uh, this takes up some of the human-prone error of manually assembling these tissues, 
out of the process and will make those tissues a lot more reliable. So I sit in the, the, the bioprinting sandbox. I, I, I huddle up with engineers, chemists, and biologists, and we try to figure out how to use this machine in order to engineer tissues. What we usually start with is a, a schematic in our minds about what kind of tissue we want to create. And then we input that into a computer software program in order to create that design. That program then combines that information that we've drawn out in this little schematic for a shape like a cylinder, for example, and controls a printer that then inputs a biological materials and cells in a way that recapitulates the shape structure layer by layer that we create in a dish. And depending on the cells and the material we put in, you can change the character of that from a blood vessel to an airway uh, to, to uh, uh, other tissues as well. We can also uh, create the specific architecture of something like a meniscus, which has a very defined cylindrical uh, semi-lunar lunar, uh, shape. And we can pattern fiber so we can rebuild the precise architecture that you see in the knee of your meniscus. Sometimes we come up with designs that look nothing like what the cells once uh, saw when you were in the body. And we can create very thin, skin-thin patches of tissues and integrate clinically important cells in that skin patch. Uh, building vasculature within there to be able to nourish that tissue so that it's ready for transplantation into patients. So in a sense, what we have with the bioprinter is a technology that enables us in an automated way to create human tissues uh, on demand and in the way that we want to create them for implantation. So what are some examples of, of what we can do with the bioprinter? And I'd like to return to this Mother's Day theme and, uh, and, and what, what is required for uh, a, a mother to be able to, to, to have a child. And uh, fertility is a really complicated process. It goes wrong all the time. But one of the essential pieces that one needs is uh, to have healthy, viable eggs that are embedded and nested within the ovaries in these structures called follicles. And every woman is born with a limited number of follicles when, and, and ovaries when they're born. So there's a limited supply. And these cells are particularly vulnerable to, to damage in, in early childhood. Now in the unfortunate circumstance that a, a young girl or a young lady gets diagnosed with cancer, one of the first things that will be done is try to treat that cancer with drugs that are essentially cell poisons, chemotherapeutic agents or radiation in order to poison those cancer cells. And that's the goal. But there's a side of that consequence, which is the eggs that are in the ovaries are often poisoned by those very same cancers. And so women that undergo cancer treatment often have show reduction fertility. But what if we can do something that would be able to preserve that fertility in a woman who's been diagnosed with cancer? What if we can take those ovaries and those, those follicles that, that nest and harbor those, those eggs and place them in a three-dimensional printed scaffold that supports their viability? Sounds like science fiction, but two years ago, an all-female group of scientists um, created a three-dimensional scaffold that supports ovary function and follicular function in a way that the tissues and those cells could be placed back in this case, in a small animal, so a, a mouse, that was rendered infertile, and they could replace and restore the fertility of that animal. Um, so uh, 3D bioprinting allows us to be able to support uh, things like the, the initial inception of life. Um, a parent's work isn't done by just getting the baby to term. And I wish it were the case that every kid that was born, boy and girl, was able to see a milestone of another birthday in a way that was um, preserved their health. But unfortunately, some of the things that we uh, get to enjoy during birthdays, like uh, the sweets that you might find in a cupcake, or in this case, uh, a, um, a marshmallow that has been on, on a flame, that, that, that sugar can, can sometimes, which is so delightful, can sometimes be a problem. But they're very common diseases that, that, that first manifest in early childhood. Diabetes. 400 million people in the world are living with diabetes. These individuals struggle with being able to, uh, first being able to take the sugar that, that they consume and enter into the bloodstream and translate that into 
the energy that, uh, that the rest of your body cells require. Uh, the reason that we can metabolize and take sugar and, and provide energy for the rest of our body cells is really falls down to a single, very specialized cell type in our body. It's found in the pancreas. It's called a, a beta islet cell. And it recognizes sugar in the blood and converts that into a signal that secretes a hormone called insulin. So for patients who have type 1 diabetes, which is about uh, only about 10% of, of those diabetic patients, but you can imagine that's still a massive number. Um, their own immune system, for some unknown reason, starts to attack those pancreatic beta cells. And those individuals no longer have the cell that can help them coordinate how to convert glucose into energy for the rest of the body. In the case of those individuals, we were fortunate. We live in a country that discovered insulin, the hormone. And so we can inject insulin and try to monitor our glucose. That's painful, inconvenient, and imperfect. Um, a child that is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in Canada, where we have great access to medicine, great health care, that, that child is going to live on average 15 years less than their average peer. So what if we could take those needles out of the equation? What if we can replace those cells that are required to maintain that balance of, of, of insulin in the body? And to a certain extent, we know that, that a potential cure for, for type 1 diabetes exists. At the turn of the century in Edmonton, clinicians took donor islets from recently deceased individuals and transplanted them into patients who could no longer control their diabetes because of their insulin injections. Those individuals were able to live a relatively healthy life without actually injecting themselves with insulin for almost five years. Uh, there aren't enough uh, donor outlets out there for every diabetic patient. And those same patients also have to take very strong medicines to suppress their immune system and render them at risk for infections or also awakening potentially dormant tumors that the immune system had kept at bay. So what if we can print uh, those very same cells in a way that protects them from the immune system? And that's currently being done. Those skin pin patches that I talked about are being created in a way that supports the viability of those same pancreatic beta cells or stem cells that we can generate more and more of in addition convert to that same character but in a manner that's protected in a way that keeps the immune system away from those cells so they're not attacked, which is essentially a cure for type 1 diabetes. And that would be transformative for the lives of those individuals and those families that are uh, dealing with this disease. The uh, uh, place for bioprinters is likely not just going to be for life-saving and life burn diseases. I actually see in a very short time frame our ability to improve the quality of life for individuals by replacing parts that start to wear down as we age, or that replace parts that we like to inflict some, some damage on because we like to do things like go cross-country skiing or downhill skiing uh, and flipping ourselves off of a hill and contorting our knees in ways that they never should have been contorted. Imagine for a moment that uh, you have a, a young athlete who aspires to be an Olympic athlete. The window for being an Olympic athlete and striving for another is really narrow. Uh, the window for uh, becoming an Olympic athlete that wins a medal, once you've literally twisted your knee and, and destroyed your meniscus, is rapidly closed. The only option for that individual, likely, is to take the portion of that damaged meniscus out of their knee or to remove the entire structure. It's great for mitigating pain in the short term. The problem is the rubbing of those bones in the knee with constant use will end up leading to a chronic arthritis in that patient, so they've had a long-term problem. We could take cadavers and, and, and replace uh, their knee that they no longer use and place into the patient. But it's hard to find a good fit for, for a younger person's knee, actually. And that's where bioprinting has a great solution. Because the structure and shape that we can conceive of in our minds, the structure and shape that's, that's, that's destroyed in that patient um, that we understand, we can replace that entire structure by just creating that same shape 
and building a municipal replacement. Replacing that tissue and that knee, getting that athlete back on the slopes as soon as they can, and getting them back on the slopes without having to worry about the long-term consequences of arthritis. Now, um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that bioprinters will be able to not only print cells and biomaterials, but the materials from the fountain of youth and will all live forever. Uh, the sad truth is that our, our bodies and tissues were meant to, to degrade and fall apart over time, and that's going to be the same for the materials that we end up printing. And um, I, I certainly don't, wouldn't ever make the argument that a bioprinter will ever even remotely approach the organ making capacity of, of a mother. Uh, uh, moms trump uh, bioprinters any day, hands down. Um, but I do think we're living in a day and age where uh, the, our knowledge gained from uh, regenerative medicine and the use of a bioprinter will be able to use materials that end up in patients. Um, most of us will probably know someone who has a bioprinted tissue in the next few years, I'd say. And that may provide an opportunity for uh, grandmothers, uh, great-grandmothers, and possibly even great-great-grandmothers uh, if they so choose. Uh, to relish in, 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 in the joy of their own organ making capacity um, and, and, and enjoy their time with their grandchildren. Thank you very much.